Hello there, and welcome back to A Course in Cognitive Linguistics. In this session, I'd like to talk about frame semantics, and I'd like to start with a little story. So, here it goes. Imagine that your country is preparing for the outbreak of an unusual disease, which is expected to kill 600 people. Two alternative programs to combat the disease have been proposed. The exact scientific estimates of the consequences of the programs are as follows. Program A, 200 people will be saved. And on program B, there is a one-third probability that 600 people will be saved and a two-thirds probability that no people at all will be saved. Now, if you were in charge of the operation, if you could choose one of these programs, what would you do? Which one would you pick? If you want to, you can pause the video here and you now you can think a little bit about it and make up your mind and then come back. Okay, I'll continue now. If you are like me, and in fact if you are like 80% of all the people who've been given this kind of problem, you would go for program A. Yeah, You would save 200 people instead of taking the risk that you might end up uh, saving nobody at all. Right, that seems very sensible, but interestingly the whole picture changes as soon as you present the two programs in slightly different ways. Namely, if you phrase program A not as 200 people will live, but rather as 400 people will die, or program B as there's one-third probability that nobody will die, and a two-thirds probability that 600 people will die. Objectively, these two ways of phrasing things result in the same thing, but nonetheless, if you give people this particular choice, then the ratios invert so that 80% of all people choose program B, and program A, the one that you and I chose, is suddenly looking a lot less popular. Only 20% of all respondents choose it. Right. Just to uh, show you that really these two presentations refer to the same things, let me juxtapose them here on this slide. So program A means 200 people will be saved. Uh, program A on the right-hand side, 400 people will die. That is the same state of affairs. Um, you could phrase program B either as there's one-third probability that 600 people uh, will be saved on the right-hand side, there's a one-third probability that nobody will die. And again, uh, a two-third probability that no people will be saved equals a two-thirds probability that 600 people will die. So, objectively, these two ways of phrasing things don't change a thing, but nonetheless, they result in a striking asymmetry of what people choose when you confront them with these programs. Right. Why is that? Why do people make seemingly irrational choices when you give them hard objective facts? That's interesting, right? Um, now, an explanation for this has been proposed in terms of frames and frame semantics. Um, what do I mean by that? Well, these phrasings of program A and B invite you to think about the problem in slightly different ways, highlighting different aspects of the problem as such. So in the first choice, um, where you and I chose program A, these programs are phrased in terms of saving lives. Yeah, Program A will save the lives of 200 people. Program B, uh, there are probabilities of how many people we can save. So we're in a frame of mind where we think about saving lives and so a certain priority emerges, namely the priority that if you can save at least some of the people, go for that. Go for program A. Now you recognize that on the right hand side of the slide um, what is being talked about is not so much saving lives but rather death is being talked about. Yeah, Program A, 400 people will die. Well that's terrible. Now program B, there is a probability that nobody will die and a probability that 600 people will die. 600 people dying, that's also terrible. Uh, but, of course, there's the probability that we might prevent deaths altogether. And so people go for program B because they have this priority. If there's a chance to avoid death, 
then we'll actually take it. Okay, so a seemingly irrational choice is explained by framing, framing the situation in different ways so that you think of different aspects as being particularly important. Okay, um, I've been using this term frames already a couple of times, so I guess I owe you a definition. Um, frames, by that I mean cognitive schemas uh, that you use to interpret events and situations in the world. So frames are your mental representations of situations that you experience very often in the world, cognitive schemas of situations. And uh, they allow you to make sense of the things that you see in the world, right? So the frame that you use gives you a certain worldview. And seeing as that there are um, many different frames, this um, allows you to interpret the same event in the world in different ways. Yeah? You can apply different frames, uh, seeing the same world slightly differently as we've seen in the saving lives, preventing deaths kind of example. Right. Frame semantics is about these frames, about these situations, and it is also about the meanings of words. Um, it is an important pillar of the study of meaning in cognitive linguistics, and it's been developed by Chuck Fillmore, who is also one of the main architects of construction grammar. Frame semantics departs in many ways from earlier classical uh, theories of meaning. I don't know if in your introduction to linguistics you've come across something that you could call an essential feature approach to word meaning where you try to define words like man, woman, boy and girl in terms of a checklist of features like human, adult and male. Those are features and you check whether uh, a certain word checks positive or negative with regard to a certain features. Um, right, on this approach, uh, I don't know how current it still is. I learned about these things in my introductory classes. Uh, you may have heard of them too. Right, so on these approaches, word meaning is defined in terms of semantic features, and these features are held to be necessary and sufficient, so that a certain list of features should allow you to distinguish reliably between man and woman, boy and girl, and so on and so forth. And uh, this checklist approach shares a number of aspects with classical Aristotelian categories. I give you the link here for the video on categorization earlier in this course, uh, where as long as all features are present, every instance of a category should be equally representative. So as long as all features are there, a word should uh, instantiate its category um, just as well as the next one. Right. Mm, <clears throat> We've seen a number of problems with a classical categorization approach. Uh, I've given you the example of game and how it's really difficult to define game in terms of necessary and sufficient features. We can try. We can say that, okay, there have to be features like there need to be opponents, games are played for fun, they have to be winners and losers, and you need luck or skills to uh, be successful in a game, to win a game. But as we've seen, there are examples of games that do not have all of these features. And a reaction uh, to this challenge, yeah, to classical categories, has of course been the prototype approach, where you say, okay, features, they don't all need to be present, it's enough if we have a prototype that unifies all of those features and then we have peripheral members of the category that only have a subset of those features. Okay, um, that's fine. That is definitely part of what, what cognitive linguists uh, have in their conceptual toolkit. But nonetheless, there is a persistent problem which necessitates the project of frame semantics to uh, get rid of the problem. Um, so in talking about prototypes, we still work with features that can be present or absent. Yeah? So the prototype has all of the typical features. Peripheral members don't have all of these features, just a subset. Um, 
Now, a persistent problem is that many everyday words are really, really hard to define in terms of features or bundles of features. And Fillmore argued that, well, it might be a good idea to get rid of features altogether to get a handle on meaning that doesn't depend on these features. And what he meant by that is that we should look for definitions of words that make reference to frames, that is to schemas of situations in which those words are used. Let me give you a concrete example by way of an exercise. So, um, grab a piece of paper and a pen and try to define the word discount uh, like you would maybe explain it to a five-year-old, okay? Doesn't have to be a dictionary definition, you know, it doesn't have to be clean. Just try to um, come to terms with the meaning of the word discount, okay? You can pause the video and uh, start it as soon as you have something. Okay, meanwhile, I'll continue. Um, so what's a discount? Can you define a discount in terms of necessary and sufficient features? Um, it seems more appropriate to approach discount uh, in a way like this, describing it in terms of when and what kind of situation you might experience a discount. So a discount is when a seller allows a buyer to buy goods at a reduced price uh, and the difference between the normal price and the new price is what you would call the discount. Okay, um, now this definition, now you understand it, it's straightforward, but nonetheless it presupposes a whole lot of information. For instance, you know, if you look at these words seller, buyer, goods, and price, um, those are things that are non-trivial, that are things that you would probably have to explain to your five-year-old as well. Yeah, so uh, before you can explain discount, you have to explain how selling and buying works. And this actually is a frame that you could call the commercial scenario frame. Discount is a word that you can only understand if you already know about commercial transactions, about the commercial scenario frame. And this frame has certain parts to it, certain frame elements as we may call them. Namely, there's a buyer, someone who buys, a seller, someone who sells, there are goods, something that's exchanged, and there's money, yeah, something that is exchanged in return, and there's usually a price, uh, you know, a certain amount of the money that you need to give the seller in order to buy something. Right. <clears throat> um, now, uh, I would invite you to uh, Google the Berkeley FrameNet project uh, to you know, get a sense of uh, what people in frame semantics have been working on, the kinds of frames that have been described. If you uh, go to the FrameNet webpage, you will find descriptions of frames like the commercial scenario frame that I just sketched out. Here, of course, you, know, you can read through this if you would like to. Uh, I won't read it to you. The main element that I'd like you to appreciate here on this slide is that each frame is defined by a set of frame elements, in this case the buyer, the goods, the money, and the seller, and these are in some kind of mutual relation. And when you talk about commercial scenarios, you mention you know, either the buyer, the goods, the money, um, or the seller, sometimes all of them, sometimes just one of them, but whether you mention all of them or just one of them, the whole frame of the commercial scenario is evoked. Here's another example for a frame, uh, the losing frame. I don't know why I picked that. It seemed fun. Um, so this frame describes a situation in which an owner loses his or her possession. So uh, something used to be in the owner's possession and then it no longer is. Um, so the core elements, the core frame elements of the losing frame are an owner and a possession, but there are also non-core elements as they're called, you know, an explanation for why something has been lost, a means by which something has been lost, a place or a time uh, when and where something has been lost. Right, 
I said earlier that uh, you know, a crucial difference between frame semantics and earlier theories of word meanings is that in frame semantics, words derive their meaning from the frames to which they belong. Okay, so discount, um, in a way, doesn't have meaning in and of itself. It has meaning because it belongs to a commercial transaction frame. It is part of a typical recurrent situation and it denotes an aspect of that situation when you buy something discounted. Um, <clears throat> to, to give you an example of how words mean by reference to frames, consider this uh, example here. Julia will open her presents after she has blown out the candles. Um, if you are, again, you know, just reading the sentence, um, you will come to the conclusion that this is about a specific situation, namely a birthday. And again, that is a frame that you have, a recurrent situation that has certain things, certain elements that recur and recur in that situation. So a birthday means that a person has a date of birth, uh, that date is celebrated each year. Now uh, the person receives presents, uh, at least as long as you know you're a child and so on and so forth. Um, the person receives a cake, there are candles on the cake, and the person is entitled to blowing out those candles. This is stuff that you fill in automatically when you read the sentence. Yeah? Um, of course, there are alternative interpretations um, available. Like for instance, you could read the sentence as okay, Julia's Christmas tree has toppled over and now there's an emergency situation. She needs to blow out the candles before a fire is starting and only after that can Julia get to opening her presents. But that's not your first interpretation, let's be honest. Yeah, You, you have been thinking about this birthday frame because it's so active after being primed with the sentence. <clears throat> Um, another motivation for adopting a frame semantic approach is that many words can actually only be defined through their frames. Discount is perhaps a good example of that, but there are also other examples like um, well, these frame-dependent words here, goal, offside, penalty, referee, goalie, corner, or foul, which are definable only against the backdrop of a soccer game. If you don't know what soccer is all about, the word offside doesn't actually mean anything to you. Okay? So offside requires the larger conceptual background of a soccer game. Otherwise, it's pretty much meaningless. <clears throat> I already mentioned that frames can be characterized in terms of their elements. Yeah? So in a frame, in a situation, there are certain elements that are crucial. Um, in the losing frame that was the owner in the possession, in the commercial scenario, buyer, seller, goods and money, in a more specific frame, like going to a restaurant, which is also a commercial scenario of sorts, there is a customer and waiter, roughly corresponding to buyer and seller, but the waiter is not actually the seller of the food. Yeah, you, you see how it's a little different. Uh, food and drink, corresponding to the goods of the commercial scenario. Uh, there is the check that you get, indicating how much you have to pay. There is the exchange of money that you are already familiar with from the commercial scenario. And a little add-on is the tip. Yeah? You, you leave a little tip to show your appreciation of the service that you got. Right, that's a famous frame that's being talked about a lot, so I felt it was necessary to include it here. Right, now let's do a little exercise. And uh, I'd like you to think about the verb smuggle. What are the frame elements that are necessary for uh, smuggling, yeah? an event of smuggling? Pause the video, think about the elements that you would list in a description of smuggling. I actually don't know if there are frame, if there's a frame element, um, if there's a frame net frame for, for smuggling, there might be. So might compare your results to what the frame that people have come up with. All right, pause the video here, do the exercise, and uh, I'll continue now.
<clears throat> there are five things, no, three core elements and two non-core. Uh, first of all, for smuggling to occur, we of course need a smuggler, let's call him the perpetrator, uh, who does the smuggling. Something illegal, hence perpetrator. Um, the smuggler smuggles goods, yeah, something that uh, is illegal to bring across a border, and uh, there's a goal where the smuggled goods are supposed to end up, or not supposed to end up, if you're working for the customs. Um, among the non-core elements here, I've listed the source from where something was smuggled, or the path along which something was smuggled. Um, let me give you a few sentences of you know, smuggling descriptions. Uh, in Frank smuggled drugs into the prison, Frank is the perpetrator, drugs are the goods, and the prison is the goal. Uh, in more and more drugs are smuggled out of Brazil, uh, we only hear about the goods and about the source, not about the goal. We don't know who the perpetrator is. Um, we don't know about the path, but crucially, you understand the entire set of frame elements, even if just you know, one or two of the frame elements are explicitly listed. It's like a frame element evokes the entire frame and you understand the individual items as parts of the smuggling frame. That's how it works. Right. Um, we started this video with the story of a terrible disease entering your country and you're trying to prevent it. And, um, well, I, I, I hope I made clear that different frames are available for uh, you know, the conceptualization of an event. We'll, we'll talk about something that's called construal in, in later episodes of this course. So frames can impose a certain perspective on an event, and um, a, um, well, a well-known distinction with regard to different perspectives again relates to the commercial scenario frame. So the same event may be presented in ways that uh, incorporate different perspectives on it. Uh, for instance, if I use the verb sell or the verb buy in a description of a commercial scenario, I can say John sold the book to Mary for $100 and I can say Mary bought the book from John for $100. I describe the exact same thing, but the frames are slightly different. Okay, so the perspectives are slightly different so that uh, in the first sentence, it seems that John initiated the action, whereas in the second one, it seems that Mary was more active uh, in this event. So the verbs buy and sell evoke the same frame, commercial transaction, but they differ in their portrayal of the participants. So in buy, the buyer is the agent, active, controlling the event, and in sell, it's the other way around. The seller is the agent that is active and controlling the event. <clears throat> Different frames can be used to make sense of the same situation. Uh, so this was the case in the preventing deaths and saving lives story. Um, and frames are actually culturally contested so that not everybody agrees on how you should view a certain situation. And a very nice example of this is one uh, given by George Lakoff, um, who, who's been interested in, in American politics and has, has worked on that for quite a while. And uh, one of his topics is how politicians talk about taxation and which words do they employ when they talk about taxation. And one formulation that he has analyzed in great detail is the formulation of so-called tax relief. Uh, when you, as a politician, talk about tax relief, you frame uh, the, uh, the issue of taxation in a certain way. Uh, namely, if you talk about tax relief, you imply that tax is a burden. It's something that you impose on people and they're burdened. It's cumbersome. It's, it's really terrible. Um, and there's a protagonist, the taxpayer, who carries that burden. <clears throat> Politicians now have the power 
to provide relief, to make the burden lighter. And so it's the politicians that give the protagonist some relief. And if you identify with the protagonist and somebody promises you a tax relief, you think, and yeah, that, that's great. That's a really good idea. Uh, no, I, I should be getting some relief, definitely. Um, and anybody trying to stop the politician from reducing taxes is actually acting against me because they're trying to prevent uh, no, that I'm getting some relief, which I really need. Okay. Now, this, of course, is a way of framing taxation that highlights certain elements but also defocuses uh, other elements. So there are certain elements of taxation that are not represented um, in the frame of you know, tax relief. For instance, um, all the benefits that come from taxation, universities, hospitals, roads, kindergartens, all of that, you know, needs to be paid and it's paid by taxes and um, it's not exactly a relief to universities and um, uh, departments of transportation if you uh, cut their funding. But the word tax relief you know, doesn't invite you to think about that. Uh, it also doesn't invite you to think about taxes as investments into future well-being. It just focuses on the here and now where you need a relief right now. So in sum, the frames that you use to uh, describe a culturally contested thing like taxation can influence the way you think about it and you make decisions about it. And of course you, you recognize that uh, thinking back to our problem of saving lives or preventing deaths. Summing up then, um, frames are an important aspect of how meaning is analyzed in cognitive linguistics. Words evoke frames and denote parts of frames so that, for instance, the word bride denotes an important participant or frame element of marriage. Um, frames impose a particular perspective on a situation. Um, this is another interesting example here. Uh, if you contrast uh, the two sentences, in 10 minutes we'll reach the shore or in 10 minutes we'll reach the coast, they mean the same thing, but crucially your approaching the point that you're targeting from different sides, okay? <clears throat> in one event you're on water and in the other event you're uh, close to the beach but on land. Frames often reflect cultural practices like for instance marriage, you know, bride, uh, football, goal, offside, or the Roman calendar. If you think about you know, the word Friday doesn't really make sense unless you know about weeks and months and years and 1984 and 2015. Um, a fourth conclusion is that uh, basic grammatical constructions of English reflect semantic frames. For instance, the ditransitive construction is about the act of a transfer and that's a frame. And then lastly, frames are culturally contested. Uh, and here I've given you the example of tax relief which frames um, an issue in a certain way that highlights certain aspects and defocuses certain other aspects. All right, I think that's it for today. Thanks for watching and hopefully I'll see you again.